Hey everyone, welcome to season 2 of the industry show. I'm Nitin Bajaj and this season we'll continue to explore the successful journey of Indian entrepreneurs. Joining us today is Manu Shah, co-founder and CEO of MS International. MSI is one of the world's leading suppliers of natural stone. Uh, Manuji, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate You're it. You're welcome, Nitin. Thanks. So, take us uh, to the beginning. You know, where were you born? Where did you go to school for? I was born in Kutch, Mandami, in Gujarat state. Okay. And at age six, uh, my family moved from Kutch to Mumbai. Okay. And I grew up from Mumbai from six to twenty-one, and I came to America at age twenty-two. Oh. And uh, so you did your undergrad in India? I did it, my undergraduate at VJTI in Bombay, Mechanical Engineering. That's, that's pretty close to my home. I'm from yeah. Jaipur. Right. So, <laughs> uh, so you, you did your engineering and then you came out to the US. How, how did, like tell us, uh, before we go there, like tell us in one sentence what, what MSI is today, what does it do? MSI is a leading supplier of house uh, surface products such as granite, marble, porcelain tiles and mosaics and we make them affordable and accessible. Affordable by we keep driving cost down mm -hmm. uh, and accessible we spread our geographic print everywhere in America. Nice. So how do you, how do you this start? Like how did you get this idea? I believe you were, you were a trained engineer and you, know, you were working a job from that to this really unconventional industry back in the 70s. Like how did it all come together? My wife uh, had our son Raj who was six months old and she said that I want to be a busy mother, not just a mother. Right. And so we started an exporting book. Our export uh, grew very uh, rapidly for the first two, three, four years, and then it started declining as most of the American industry uh, started going into the Far East, like mm -hmm. the Korea, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong. And, but imports started growing. Yeah. And uh, we are, since that, we have not. So what was the first order that you got? How what was the what was the dollar amount of that order? Do you remember? The first order we received order was five hundred sixty dollars wow. of exporting electronics. Our the most proudest moment for me and my wife was the first year. We our total sales in first year, me full time working in another job and my wife doing full-time motherhood. We found time to do export. Our first year sales were $4,600. Oh. And that's not the unique part. The unique part is we made $1,200 net. Wow. We used to save only $2,000 a year. <laughs> now suddenly we have 60% more savings. Really? And we were so tickled. Oh. And this is great. Is. Now, now every minute we sell that much. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So, you know, just before the show started, we were talking about how MSI has grown. So, can you kind of bring us to where it is today, you know, from going from $100,000 in the first couple of years to... So, uh, we normally don't look at that we want to be so big, we just look at it, how much big we can be next year. It's yeah. all incremental. <laughs> but this incremental allows us never to stop growing. It's, mm -hmm. This is our 40, 30 year beginning and we every year has been a better than a previous year. For nice. all, we went through five recessions right. and not a single time we have suffered negative. We normally try as a company to be twice the industry rate mm -hmm. and we have successfully done nearly all the time. Oh, you, you mean growth rate in terms growth of growing year to year? So we, from 
77 when we crossed first hundred thousand dollars it took nine years to become million dollar in 86 then we by 96 we become 10 million 2005 we become 100 million and uh, this year in 2017 we'll cross 10 digit mark a million wow. so that's uh, we between 9 and 12 years we grow 10 times that is amazing. And you know, that's the most amazing part to me is how did an Indian immigrant, an engineer by profession, take a startup, a home-based startup from, you know, in a very unconventional industry. And you know, it's not one of those sexy high-tech industries that usually Indians are connected with now. So, but then you also use a lot of tech, right? In, in, this, in this setup, I know you were walking me around the other day and you have a lot of RFID, you were talking about drones. So, like, how, how do you... Well, we, we look at opportunity a little differently. We look at opportunity not with a new technology or new breathtaking product. We look at opportunity, what others are not doing. Okay, and by looking at that, point of view, we realize that stone business, which is 7,000 years at least old, mm -hmm. when first pyramids were built, yeah. many parts of the world, nothing much has changed how the stone was being distributed, how it was sold. Mm -hmm. Yes, the method had changed how you produce, and, but the selling and the way it was, we realized the use of technology can put us forefront of everybody else. And we did remarkable use of technology in this law tech business. 1984, when no one had even heard what fax machine is, we were already using a fax machine. And that was allowed us to transfer diagrams and for uh, uh, sketches from our small home in Portway, Indiana. Mm -hmm. By fax, to we could send to India, mm -hmm. get a quotation, receive the fax back, send the fax to our customers in Vermont or in Minnesota, and we were three to five times faster in hours or days compared to your competitor within America. Wow, that's and, and then 96, we introduced digital camera. Mm -hmm. And that was the same thing, Movica. We must have distributed probably 50 or so digital camera to our favorite customer mm -hmm. and our favorite supplier. They sent wow. us the picture of new stone, new quarries, and through the internet, we we'll sent it to other people. And they were all able to see so fast so this time was compressed like anything. So you invested in your vendors so that you can kind of partner up with them and yes. give them an incentive so that they can return these images faster to you so you're first to market. Yeah. Our, wow, that's our supply chain is our truly partner. Nice. Yeah. And even this, the, you know, you have all the, the marble slabs and everything, you have RFIDs on them. So it also helps your vendors to be streamlined in game and speed. We, we, we don't exist without information. Mm -hmm. MSI now stands for moving at the speed of information. <laughs> so, so we try to say that, hey, no one has a right to hold up the information. Right. Information must keep moving from the day the supplier receives the purchase order mm -hmm. to how it will fulfill to when it puts into the ship to import department, vendor, everybody has a need to know basis mm -hmm. knowledge. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the customs, when it comes to our warehouse, the pictures has been uploaded for already five weeks in the website. Mm -hmm. So customer can choose what they're looking even the mm -hmm. product is not even on American shore yet. Wow. And that's how we are staying ahead by providing information. Mm -hmm. Our uh, rate at 
which we turn over inventory is faster than industry by at least three quarter points. Wow. So the industry may be running at two times, mm -hmm. we at 2.75 times. Mm -hmm. And that's that's pretty huge given the size of your operations, yes. right? A very capital yeah. incentive business, a lot of inventory, we stock about 12,000 truck load of materials wow. in USA. Wow. And our largest warehouse is not physical warehouse, our largest warehouse mm -hmm. is the ocean. In the ocean, at any given time, yeah. we have 4,000, 4,500 truck wow. load of the material. It's constantly in, moving. It's constantly moving. Wow. How many from countries are you sourcing from and how many countries are you supplying to? Yeah. I think we are sourcing from 36 countries. 70 ports and it comes to 16 uh, ports in America on the ocean and then it fits back into the inland ports such as Chicago uh, and uh, Atlanta. And so we have this amazing globe back here. Is that kind of representative of the different kinds of stones around the world? Those are all stored from different countries, yes. Wow. It represents those. That is really amazing. So, how many, how many employees have you grown to? I mean, it started with the two of you back in 76. Yeah. How many employees do you have? The business was started by my wife and right. I was helping. And she outsmarted me <laughs> by outsourcing to me to take care of it. <laughs> Before the word outsourcing become popular. Okay. And uh, we have grown to now close to 1,600 employees, 1,400 of them. And I mean, I'm sure that doesn't count the number of indirect jobs that you're creating in oh, through your vendors and through in different uh, countries. That's a huge. Yeah, that's a huge. We are supporting 120,000 jobs worldwide. Wow. Direct jobs, not indirect. These are the people. If something happens to MSA today, those 120,000 people will not have a job tomorrow. Wow. We worry about it. We think of it, what we can do to keep these people on the job. Half of those jobs are in rural area of the world. People grow up, they like their home when they are grown, they are born. Yeah. Their streams and their lakes and their rivers and their jungles, that's where they want to stay. But there are no jobs, so they move to the big city and they become part of this land. Right. We are preventing. Of yeah. those 120,000 jobs, 60,000 or more are in rural area of the world. That's huge. Yeah, and you know, that's the true spin of entrepreneurship, right? The entrepreneur is thinking not just about making money, but also about creating opportunities and jobs and livelihoods and making the world a better place. Hey, making money, probably never occurred to me or my wife as first, second, third or fourth priority. Mm -hmm. Okay, we do know that it helps to meet first four priority, mm -hmm. but that now was our aim. And today that's where we are still. Making creating job remains our priority. Making in the lives of the changing the life of the people. Mm -hmm. Anywhere, everywhere, it's very important part to us. Okay, and doing these kind of things from such a absolute speed at which we do, mm -hmm. using a high tech into the low tech area, we will make sure that it goes to everybody. Information spread, and everyone is supposed to act on the information mm -hmm. as fast as they can. And you know, there's there's a lot of talk around. You know, people say if you want to get into a business or start something of your own, you should really be passionate about it, right? What about? I mean, this is a very unconventional industry, right? So, like, what about stones or rocks made you passionate or motivated about it? Well, believe it or not, when I grew up for the first six years, mm -hmm. 
stone were my toys. <laughs> there were no toys. He, I come from lower middle class. There were no stone. My father was making money in, in Bombay mm -hmm. and we were living in Kutch. Yes. So it, it's fascinating how the stone industry, if you look at the history of stone and human, mm -hmm. the Homo sapien, yeah. it's remarkable. When Eight million, six million years ago, the humans started walking straight. Suddenly they realized, we have two hands. Mm -hmm. What can we do with it? So they picked up the stone to protect themselves and get the food by killing birds right. or killing the uh, roosters and so on, okay? Chickens. Right. That changed the way they were able to protect. They were, had a food. They started living in the caves. They started control. Everything is done through natural stone. Okay, mm -hmm. and we owe a lot to the natural stone. How it has changed. Mm -hmm. And fifty thousand years ago, they had a controlled fire. Mm -hmm. We started living in the caves. Mm -hmm. Family, because now we have everything. Mm -hmm. You know, place to stay, but the caves were made up of stone. Mm -hmm. So all this is really nicely depicted in uh, one of the documentary for 50 minutes in, on the YouTube, Man, History of Man and Natural Storm. Yeah, we'll put that on the comment section in this video. So, but that's, that's a really good view. I never thought of it that way, that stone has changed humankind over the Wow, years. look at that. All other living creatures, the elephant, the big whale, nobody has figured out how to use stone. Right. Is the human hand has figured out with what to do with the stone, and that has changed themselves right. and their world. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's really amazing. So, you know, going back to MSI when you <coughs> started back in seventy uh, six, what was the landscape here, the business landscape, and how was it different than you know today? Like, what was it? There were obviously a lot of challenges. Information wasn't as easily available, like you said. You know fax machines and other things that didn't come around to the 80s, computers weren't even there, there was no internet. So as an immigrant, you know, coming into a new country and, and in fact, in the light of the fact that there were no Asians allowed in the country till as late as like in the 60s, what, what was the what was the landscape? Well, during 67, there's a lot of Indian like me, okay? mm -hmm. there were two to the landscape in here versus landscape in India. Right. You have to remember, there were no jobs in India. The best job from top-notch engineering school I can get was a mechanic in a fab, in a cloth mill, mm. all right? And that was kind of a very insulting. America was the other way. America had, was in war with Vietnam. Mm -hmm. They were, on the race to put the man on the moon mm -hmm. right. and their defense spending was so they badly needed engineers. Right. They were happy when we graduated, they were happy to give us time. Please stay here. Wow. Please help us to this do because the, all the best and brightest were already those who were American citizens, either they're working in defense or they were working with NASA. Right. Okay. Yeah. So the rest of the industry was suffering without engineer. Okay. And so they were very happy to take us. We were really kind of bringing, please stay here. Wow. And even then, you kind of ventured out and, and started your own. Well, I did work for seven years right. before we ventured right. out. Okay. That was important part to learn America. Reality is America is a great country. I nearly everything in business we have done, we have learned from America. The Midwest, the, uh, the New England state, that taught me a very, very big, nice, good lessons of business. That laid the foundation for you to kind of get out and start something. Yes. Did you use any mentors along the journey? Like as you were kind of getting into this? We had no mentors. Uh, we did not look for it. 
either. We just kept experimenting between me and my wife and and I'm, I'm, I'm very ambitious and kids, he kept me drawing Lakshman Rekha around me, <laughs> telling me don't cross that, okay? And that's how it was, okay? So we kept doing many things with my ambition and her trying to control my ambitions, but stay within focus on what we should be doing, nothing else. Nice. So talking about mentors, you know, one of my mentors said, a successful entrepreneur has to be really skilled in, in three different skills. Uh, be able to sell and then be able to deliver on that promise that, that you sold to the person and then be able to collect payments and you know get your money out. So which one of these were you good with as you started up and then which ones did you, you had to learn? I'm an engineer so logistics delivery is my product. Yeah. My wife was great in collecting money. You can <laughs> see still the head of our account resource department. So it comes to sell. We continuously looked at it from demand versus supply. Okay. And we said we got to keep creating demand. If your demand keeps increasing, you are in good shape. Right. If demand decreases and supply increases, right. we are in bad shape. Right. This is the first principle of marketing. Right. Don't try to have in, keep increasing supply mm -hmm. and not enough demand. Right. So we kept working on the demand part. All right. Once I realized that, it became a little easier for me. I'm not a easier for me to sell, but I'm not a born salesman. Right. I'm more logistic and strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing how you know, it's it's very simple, but it's so important to have the basics in place, right? Like just yes. like cash flow. Yeah. yeah. Nice. So when at what juncture did you kind of sense that you know things were falling into place and you know this was taking off? Like when did you decide to completely switch out of your job and go do this full time? So up to, we were uh, invited to supply black granite. Uh, in 1981 to supply to Vietnam War Memorial. Mm -hmm. So I was still nervous. It was very politically mm -hmm. uh, risky move because America, a good part of America didn't want it. A black color granite or mm -hmm. coming from foreign countries which supported Vietnam, mm -hmm. India had supported mm -hmm. it. So then there were enough opposition, but it, so I kept my job until the last panel was erected at the Vietnam War Memorial. Yes. The next week after that, I turned in my resignation and we started selling more monuments and then eventually more black granite tall slabs and then all other colors. Wow, that's pretty amazing. And, and for an Indian, I mean, it was, it was still an American company, but like you said, you know, kind of getting over that challenge of getting the stone from India and back to for a war memorial in, in the U.S. That's a pretty big step. Yeah, this this challenge is all, you know, again, America is a great country. Everything was available, not on Google at that time, right. <laughs> but in the library. And, right. and you learn from, and the people were helpful, mm -hmm. you know, or banking. Port Wine, Indiana, our accountant, our neighbors, all were helping us to grow. And that was very good for us. Nice. Okay. So there weren't, there weren't any challenges, stereotypes, or, you know, sometimes people kind of face that. Even now, you know, even 40, 50 years later, we still have those. No, there was one stereotype which bothered me a lot, and it was, it took us a while to get over with it. Everyone wanted an Italian marble, right. okay, in their home. Yeah. That name had some glamour in it. Right. It was a brand. Except we were bringing material from India, China, Brazil. We were not bringing much from Italy. Right. Okay, so it was challenging. Mm -hmm. And my story was everybody, when the stone was made over 100 million years ago, <laughs> there were no countries. Right. 
So it does not matter where it comes from, it's how Mother Nature made it. And when that happened, it become much clearer to people that let's not say, I want Italian marble, mm -hmm. I want good marble, I want good granite, I want good travelty, right. no matter where it comes from. Right. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the quality and the color and, and, and the material that you like, yeah. not as much as from where it comes from. Yes. So how has, you know, talking about culture and the color, um, how has your Indian ethnicity and upbringing helped you or deterred you from being a successful businessman? Uh, Indian ethnicity probably to help that education was very important part. That was a big help to me. Okay, my religion also taught me to stay focused. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those two things kind of help me. They don't deviate from it. Uh, all business process and what I do in business, I learn everything. Or by experimenting with my wife in the last 13 years with our son, two sons who are co-president of the company. Right. We experiment, we argue, we, we eventually debate and then we do what we think is right. Mm -hmm. But as such, the family environment, taking care of people, one area it did help me. In India, we respect elders. Right. I decided why they don't respect everybody. Okay? okay? Everybody, whether he speaks English or not, whether he is a janitor or he is a UPS service guy, mm -hmm. I respect everybody. Right. And when you start doing respecting all of these people, that's, the reward is far more than people think. Right. They also respect you, they listen to you. Almost everything. As entrepreneur, one thing is very clear to me. 25 to 30 percent of your time, keep your ears open. Mm -hmm. Ask questions and listen to them. Instead of lecturing them, listen to them. Right. And you will get, you don't have to listen every idea, you don't have to observe every idea you get, mm -hmm. but the idea which is practical for you to do it, you use it. Mm -hmm. well, that's so. That's huge. So, you're kind of going from you know, being MSI specific to what are you most excited about in your life at this moment? At this moment in life, I'm more keen on philanthropy. Okay. I am right now roughly 45% I'm spending time on philanthropy and 55% of my time I'm spending in MSI. I'm still putting 65 hours a day, but that's divided. <laughs> and I enjoy it very much. And how hundreds of thousands of people through Akshay Patra, mm -hmm. the little two kitchens were built in, uh, built in Kutch, mm -hmm. 100, up to 122,000 people will get a good, nutritious meal every day. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah. The same thing, the initiative we have taken to Pratham, mm -hmm. it's way beyond you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Try to think of it, that you have an education without school, mm -hmm. the classroom without teacher. Yeah. That's what Pratham is trying to do right. in the villages, mm -hmm. where 20 to 30 million people has neither school nor classroom, nor teacher. So what are they going to learn? They are going to learn from tablet. In this, we are giving between five to 6,000 tablets mm -hmm. through the Pratham and they are going to expand that to uh, Google has agreed to put another three times money we are putting. Mm -hmm. So our two million will become six million. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And all of this will change the way we think of education. No, that's huge, and you know, obviously, Sarvamangal Trust, your your family trust that you set up, uh, you're by far one of the largest philanthropists that I know in, in this part of the world. So you know, you mentioned Akshay Patra. You also helping kickstart the kitchen in Bhuj, uh, which is breaking ground as we speak, and uh, that's that's going to feed what, like 50, 70 thousand kids every year. Uh, every year, over hundred thousand kids wow. every year. 
every day of every year. Every day of the school year. Yeah. Yeah. And for a lot of those kids, as we know, in parts of Akshay Patra, uh, for a lot of these kids, this is the only time. Everybody wants to experiment. Try to have a hungry kid and see how much yeah. he wants to learn. Yeah. Every mother knows without food, they don't learn much. Right. So they feed them. Yeah. Well, we should apply the same to the kids who yeah. are not getting good food. Right. That's what Akshay Patra is doing. So do you think, you know, talking about philanthropy, uh, do you think we as Indians do enough? Are we giving enough? You know, like there's a lot of talk about Americans and, you know, they set up, like Mark Zuckerberg set up a, an organization and said, I'm going to give 99% of my wealth away. I mean, you are doing it and I, and I know a few others are doing it, but it, are Indians in general doing enough? For the Indians in general, who has successfully grown their wealth in America, mm -hmm. most of them are doing it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not here to lecture what they do. There comes a time in life they decide when they want to do it. Right. You know, I cannot say that age 45 I was as generous as I am today. Right. Okay? It's a personal and, decision. You know, you it's do. probably you are spending more time today on philanthropy than I was at your age. Right. So it's, it's, it's everybody will realize when is the right time to give when it's they like start. Religion, right? I mean, so it's like religion, right? That's up to them to decide when is the right time to spend mm -hmm. time, energy, money and effort. Yeah. Well, I guess, uh, you know, on that uh, high note, uh, we would, would like to thank you for taking time uh, to do this. Oh, there are some questions uh, from the audience, so let's take those. Thanks. Um, so, the question is about for an aspiring Indian entrepreneur today, is U.S. better or, or Canada? I mean, you, you have a business in Canada too, so yes. do you think they should come here or do, should they go to Canada? Well, sidestepping what has happened recently in the American election, mm -hmm. there is no other country great in great the world. world who likes it. Just like to think of me. If I had gone to Japan, Germany, or stayed in India, mm -hmm. would I be as successful? No way. There is no doubt America is the right country for entrepreneurship. Canada is probably second. Okay. And maybe even Australia may come there. But America, there is no doubt. It's, this is it. That's how it is grown. That's how it is. Okay. Um, all right. Well, there's a, a demand to do a rapid fire a couple of questions. Okay, uh, I'll try. Um, I'm not the fastest. I, I don't like <laughs> that. I, I let me tell you, I don't like this elevator speech <laughs> of entrepreneurs to decide in 30 seconds whether their idea is worth or not. <laughs> I, I Even it took me five years to perfect our ideas. <laughs> All right, then I'll rapid fire it and then you can answer. Yes, exactly. What's your favorite city? My favorite city is Southern California, Los Angeles. Okay. And yeah. Uh, the same day you can see the, the right snow now the snow covered mountain and you can see the ocean and you see and see the desert. Yeah. Okay. The best place you can ever be. Right? Yes. Uh, what's the one thing that you own that you wish you did? One thing I own, I wish I did not. Yeah. Uh, probably. Ego. Okay. I don't want my ego. I want to get rid of it while wow. I did this. That's something I own. I don't want it. But to be honest, you're one of the most humble persons I know. So I don't think you have any. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it, 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 when you start to the size I am, sometimes ego gets to you and then you regret that that's not yeah. what made you where you are. That's, that's deep. <laughs> Wasn't expecting that in rapid fire, but <laughs> I guess that comes from this one. Uh, what's your favorite song? My favorite song is between me and my wife. Nice. Nice. That's the one we both love. That's, that's one of my favorite songs. It says, yeah. So that's what it is. It's personal and it's yes, yeah. it's very relevant to me and my wife. We spent too far, too much time together. 
Yeah. And they sing our story for us. How long have you been married? Like over 50 this years? is our 46th year. Wow. Going to the Golden Jubilee pretty soon. Yes. All right. Well, thank you once again. All right. And uh, you know, I'd like to take a quick moment to thank our sponsors, uh, Sea Castle Insurance. Uh, please look them up, seacastle.co, uh, for your insurance needs, uh, for your business insurance needs, and bombamade.com if you're looking for any handmade gift items for corporate or personal giving. And uh, yeah, join us for our next show. We'll announce that pretty soon on our webpage, The Industry Show, facebook.com slash industry show. We'll see you guys soon. Thanks a lot.